Hey everyone, and thanks for jumping back into the Cryptoverse. Today, we're gonna to talk about Bitcoin and we're gonna be discussing the total indicator risk. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and also check out the holiday sale on Into the Cryptoverse Premium at intothecryptoverse.com. We do have several, several different tiers available, so make sure you check it out. Let's go ahead and jump in. Now, this is the total indicator risk for Bitcoin. And as you can see, it actually accounts for various things like price metrics, on-chain metrics, and social metrics. The price metrics inc include things like the Bitcoin risk score itself, which we've talked about before, and that's only dependent on that. It's just one thing, and it depends on the price. It also depends on the total market cap risk, logarithmic regression, uh, the total market cap regression, which we talk about a lot. That's the Bitcoin, the beauty of mathematics series. It also depends on other things like this corridor that we've talked about a few times and the fear and greed index. Now, we also have the on-chain risk, and that's dependent on the MVRV Z-score, the peel multiple, the MVRV score, the minor cap to thermo cap, the transaction fees, the market cap to thermo cap, the terminal price, and then we have a couple other options here, but right now I have them turned off. And then the social risk is, is uh, created by YouTube subscribers, show the new YouTube subscribers to popular cryptocurrency YouTube channels, YouTube views to popular cryptocurrency YouTube channels, new followers to cryptocurrency Twitter analysts, new Twitter followers to popular Twitter or to popular exchanges on Twitter, and new Twitter followers to layer ones on Twitter. And when you combine all of them, you get a risk metric that looks something like this. Now, how did you combine, combine all of them is the question, right? How do you combine all of them? Well, there's two ways. Number one, a lot of these, a lot of these indicators, like they oscillate, right? Um, and, and let me give you an example, right? So if I were to go down and let me find uh, very, very quickly, let me just find a, an indicator that, that is a really great example of an oscillator. And you might, you might be familiar with it, right? It's, it's just simply the, um, the MVRB Z score. Okay, so if I were to go over here and find the MVRB Z score, what you'll notice is that it, it more or less oscillates, right? More or less oscillates. It, always, it tends to come down very close to similar levels. Of course, the peaks are, are somewhat all over the place. But the whole idea is that it oscillates between a given range, right? And so what you can do is you can normalize this, say, between 0 and 1 to sort of capture where it spins, where, where this indicator spins its time. So if it's, if it's all the way down here, you know, at the lower end of the range, and that would mean it's closer to that 0 risk level. And as it, as it goes higher, it goes to the higher risk level of 1. So that's one way to look at this, okay? Now, not all of the indicators are oscillators. Some of them, are, like, they, they have the same bottom part of the range, but the top part of the range tends to, tends to go down. And that would be something like the one-year ROI, right? Like, you can see that the bottom part of the range tends to be very familiar from one cycle to another, but the top part of the range decreases as time goes on. And so this is not an oscillator. This is, this is one that the, the, the bottom is an oscillator where it bounces off a very familiar level, but the top tends to go down. So some indicators include diminishing returns within the indicator itself. Some don't because some of them uh, are just more, more or less oscillators. So when you do this to all of them, right, you can come up with a risk metric for every single indicator between zero and one. And the whole idea when you do that is that you can then combine them all, right? So you've normalized all of them between zero and one. You can then combine them all into a single risk metric. And when you do that, this is what you get. And we even have the ability here to sort of turn on and off some of these, some of these different metrics, right? And you can see how it would affect the actual risk. So we're going to walk through this a little bit. One thing I would draw your, that I would like to draw your attention to is when you look at this chart, first of all, I should explain what it is, right? So y-axis, logarithmic scale of price, and x-axis is obviously just time. It's color-coded between, between blue to red. Blue is, is zero risk. Red is one, okay? Now, zero is not really zero. Of course, there's no such thing as zero risk in crypto. This is just based on a secular bull market, okay? And coincidentally, right, it was because this stuff is based on a secular bull market and equities that has kept me fairly risk averse during 2022. <coughs> because, you know, while I know a lot of people were hopeful that June was going to be the bottom, considering that this metric was built out of a secular bull, a secular bull market and equities, I would have expected us to 
you know, really go down and test some lower levels, which we have. So when you look at this chart, again, blue, low risk, red, high risk. You can kind of see how it ebbs and flows. Let's hide everything and only look at the risk between zero to, zero to 0 0.1. What do you see? Deep value zone here in 2011, right? Deep value. It didn't mean the first time it went to this level that was the bottom. It wasn't, but this was the deep value zone for accumulation before the next bull run. You go to the next bear market. Deep value zone did not occur until January 13th. And then it was it lasted off and on until September of that same year. We popped above that level a few times, so right, it would have given you plenty of opportunities to come back in had you not come in on the first attempt. And then in 2018 and early 2019, we also found that deep value zone. What you'll notice is that those deep value zones do not come around that frequently. The time between the one in 2011, 2015, I mean, this is almost 2012, this is almost 2012 when it occurred. So you could argue this is about three years, but you're talking about a little over three years between the deep value zone from this bear market to this one. And then <coughs> the deep value zone of this accumulation phase in September of 2015, we did not come back down to the deep value level until December of 2018 or November, December of 2018. So you're, getting, you're, you're talking a little over three years. Now, if you look at it, right? So the last time we were in the deep value zone was February of 2019. Three years from, yeah, February 2019, three years from then, right? So you go 2020, 2021, 2022, maybe add a few months because every other one was out in a few months. That gets you down to the summer of 2022. But you don't see that here, right? We have not hit that deep value level. Now, there's a bit of a nuance here because this includes a lot of different things. And I, I, I feel compelled to tell you the whole story as always. If you remove the social risk, it would say that we've been in the deep value zone, okay? So this is what happens when you remove the social risk. Deep value, the deep value zone, the deep value zone, also March of 2020, the deep value zone. And then again, when you remove the social risk, it would say that we've been in the deep value zone basically since June, okay? Since June. Hasn't really done a whole lot, right, at this point because it's just been a slow bleed when you remove the social risk. However, if you remove the price risk and the on-chain risk and only look at the social risk, which was only really developed, you know, somewhere over here because we just didn't have the data for it, you can see that there's not really a few, there's only a few times where it actually it actually gave that gave that signal, right? We just simply don't have data on it back here. If we did, you know, it would it would show that this was lower risk. It's just that it, it hasn't really been it hasn't really existed for very long, right? Like you can see that it it doesn't really start existing until well over here when it was when it came out we have it at, at pretty low pretty low risk levels but what you'll notice in all of this is that if you remove the social risk it says we're already in the deep value zone right that's what it would suggest if you add the social risk on it says we're not one way to interpret that could just simply be we need, you know, we could, might just need a little bit more time. Um, could mean a lot of things, right? And you might say, well, why is the social risk so important? Well, one, one thing to consider with the social risk is it's one of the only indicators that actually called the second top, right? So it called the first top, and then here it actually went back to the 0.9 to 1 wristband on the second top, right? So it's one of the few that actually went back up to that highest risk band at the November peak. And it's coming down quickly, okay? It's coming down very, very quickly. So, I mean, you know, just a few days ago, it, when, when we had all that recent you know, news about what happened with FTX, the social risk went back up to 0.698. Now it's all the way back down at, at 0.269. So you know, the social risk is coming down quite quickly so if it just comes down a little bit more, then I imagine, I imagine you will see that deep value zone uh, reached, right? So that's just one way to, to, to look at the data, okay? 
You could also play around with this, and if you say, well, maybe I don't really like the, um, or maybe you want to add on the supply and profit and loss to this, you could do that and kind of see how it affects things. And you can see that by turning on and off any single indicator, it doesn't really have a huge effect, but when you include a whole set of indicators, it, it can start to have a pretty big effect, right? When you include like a whole set of them, like especially like the social risk. But you can see here, social risk on, it calls the second top. Social risk off, it doesn't really call it. it we only barely get into overheated territory at like a 0.65 risk or so on, on, on the total thing. So this is what it looks like. <coughs> Now what I'm going to do is we're going to switch it over to the raw values. So not color coding it, just looking at the raw values so you can see where the total risk is right now. And what I see and what I've said for, you know, the entire year, basically, every single bear market, we eventually got down to the lower risk levels, right? In the first bear market, we went down to 0 0.0147. In the second bear market, we went down to 0 0.0184. And in the third bear market, we went down to... 0.0152. Currently, we're at 0.132. So the one way that this is going to go down in the coming weeks is if even if the price stays constant, this actually could go down because the social risk would continue to deteriorate, right? We have to remember that. If the social risk continues to deteriorate, and this is one third social risk, then the total indicator risk will eventually come back down. So my thesis on this is that, you know, we simply, you know, if you look at this, <coughs> just getting a little bit more time will we'll, um, we'll go a long way in, in helping this social risk to come down. I think that this would have come down quicker, you know, had it not been for, you know, the hype behind the merge and whatnot with Ethereum. And, and of course, the social risk went elevated again with the, with the fallout of FTX. So some things have, have kind of kept it elevated for a bit longer. But so far, you know, so far, it's done a pretty good job, right? And so far, the, if you go back to June, the lowest the total risk went was 0.135. And recently it went down to 0.125. You know, we put in a lower low on the price and the total indicator risk followed. So, you know, I look at this and I say, all right, well, to me, this is a useful indicator for like a, a DCA strategy, right? And, and I've talked about this before. It's like dynamic dollar cost averaging at low risk levels. I tend to go in a bit heavier. And then at higher risk levels, as, as we go up the wristbands, I tend to put less and less money into the market. And above a certain risk level, I stop putting anything into the market. Last cycle, I stopped at 0.5 risk because above this risk level, I just simply did not want to buy Bitcoin. Of course, this leads to people, you know, arguing, oh, well, what are you doing? You're not buying it and it's a bull market, but I don't regret it for a second. And even in the summer, it allowed me to buy a little bit once again, right? And then we came back up. But I look at this indicator <coughs> and I think of it as a tool of how I can how I can DCA into the market. Now, the one thing you have to consider though is when this is going down, if you start DCAing as it's going down, it doesn't mean that it can't just keep going down, right? Like, you know, we're currently at the same risk level that we're, you know, where we were here in November of 2021 and, and in December of 2015 and in, in September of 2011. And all of those examples, the total indicator risk eventually went lower, right? In every single example, the total indicator risk went lower and the price also eventually went lower as well. So, you know, I look at this and I say, well, you know, you could, one, one way to do it is to just DCA below a certain risk level. Another way, of course, if you want to get more uh, aggressive, right, is to try to figure out where exactly the bottom is. This is a more, a more difficult or dangerous approach because you run the risk of, of not getting any Bitcoin before the next bull market. But, I mean, so far, that strategy would not have been the worst strategy, right? Like the total indicator risk continues to, to go down quite quickly. It might also be worthwhile to add a moving average to some of this stuff and kind of see how it looks like. So if you add a moving average, you can, you can see where we currently are. And then you can see see where we currently are in the context of all prior bear markets. So we're sort of just out of that deep value zone when you include the social risk. Again, I, I will be remiss if I did not remind you of that. If you exclude the social risk, you can see that we're already pretty low, right? There were still two bear markets, though, that we went lower. 
this bear or this the, the most recent bull market was was quite interesting because we had two peaks at around the same price and and it's arguably kept the social risk elevated longer than it otherwise would have i think a lot more people had time to come in up here than than they would have in say other other cases where we didn't really spend that much time at this new peak we just hit a new peak and then we just kind of came down uh, i mean this one we did have a double peak but the other ones, the other ones we really didn't. It was just one one and done, right? One peak and then it was over. But again, you can see the social risk and the total risk is in the process of coming down. As we get into that deep value zone, if history is an indication, it would suggest that is a, a fairly attractive level for Bitcoin. And I guess it's up to you to determine whether you think the social risk is an important component or not. If you look at the risk metric excluding the social risk without a moving average, you can still see that every prior bear market eventually went lower than where we are today, right? So like look to see where we currently are, the current low anyways, every bear market went lower than where we are today, even excluding the social risk. So always an important consideration as you navigate crypto. I just want you guys to, to see the risk levels for what they are and try to figure out you know what makes the most sense for you again if you guys like the content make sure you subscribe to the channel give the video a thumbs up we also do have the sale on into the cryptoverse premium at into the cryptoverse.com you can find a link to that in the description below or the pinned comment we do have several different tiers okay so you can check that out one of them's even free we have several different tiers a lot of people had asked about that um so do check that out in the description below or the pinned comment thank you guys for tuning in make sure you subscribe and i'll see you next time bye